let's go ahead and commence. So we have Robert Christensen from Cloud Nation. So thanks for bringing the Southern California weather. Yes. <laughs> Appreciate it. So he's going to speak on, by golly, powerful server management. So uh, I'll, just, I'll just let you start. Thank you. All right. Okay. You want that mic? Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, hopefully. Hey, uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I don't like uh, lecterns very much, so I tend to wander. Um, and I'd be more than happy to answer questions throughout this session. This is going to be interactive, so if you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand, yell it out. We're kind of a small enough group so that we can hear each other and make sure that that's available to you. So um, again, I'm Robert Christensen. I'm the Chief Technology Officer with Cloud Nation. Uh, my job here today is to help you understand how to use cloud servers and moving people from on-premise into the cloud. And so this is going to be a technical session. We're going to talk a lot about uh, bits and bytes and how things work and obstacles that you're going to be running into. And your job is to give us feedback, ask questions, and then have an exchange of that information. So let's get started. So I love this, I love this slide. Why would a customer ever want to move from their office closet with a poor pan management, power management, bad ventilation, no redundant services, poor security, and no upgrade path? Why would they ever want to move away from that? This, wait, 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 wait. Heck, I've seen that before, man. My last business had that, you know? That's an upgraded one, right? <laughs> That's a flat screen. What happened to the CRT that was there, right? No, it's not monochrome amber. Who might, CGA, right, back in the day. <laughs> All right, you know, to a cloud server where there's highly redundant power, Fire protection, Fort Knox security, you know, massive computing power, four and five nines SLAs, no long-term contracts, only buy what you need. Why would they ever consider going from that, right, to this? Well, you guys know this. Why would they move? Scalability, mobility, lock-in security, these all seem like duh moves, right? They're just like, Really, am I having, actually having this conversation with you? However, unless they've actually felt the pain of these things, they will not move for any of these reasons. How many times have you guys put in a quote for a really good system that you know is bulletproof so that you don't have to drive out to see them at 2 o'clock in the morning because the system crashed and you bailed them out for 6 a.m. the next morning, okay? only for them not to buy the quote because you bailed them out, okay? They aren't gonna do that unless they feel the pain. So what is the reason they buy? Total cost of ownership, savings, it's a pocketbook decision, okay? So we're gonna have a technical session, but let's get some reality out on the table here, okay? If it's not a, a, an economics, conversation with them about scalability, mobility, these type of things, they're simply not going to, it's going to fall on deaf ears. It's just going to fall on deaf ears, period. So this works great if you've got someone who had a complete hard drive failure and you literally do not have any way to get them back up for three or four days. They're, that's a great time for cloud, baby. <laughs> you know, throttle down. But, you know, if you're actually dealing with somebody who hasn't had any of those kind of catastrophes or the, the sprinkler popped inside their server room and flooded the place, you know, it's a tough, tough, tough sell. Okay, so you know they should do this. You know that, you should, that, that the customers should go to pull up for stuff. However, the customers makes the decisions on risk and cost. These are the two things when they're evaluating the moving that server to the cloud, they're going to ask these questions. So let's talk about the need. Many of you specialize in SBS, specifically you have an SBS servers that you're managing right now. And did you know there are over 750,000 SBS servers in the market right today with no upgrade path? They literally had end of life in 2011. In addition, there are millions more servers out there that are well beyond the refresh cycle and customers are asking, what about the cloud? Specifically, I'd ask about the cloud. And I got an example. We happen to have a gentleman who is my colleague and partner in crime, Tom Poolback here. And I asked them to sit in for one question and one question only. What were you doing this morning at 6.30 this morning? 6.30 this morning, I was, I was actually on the phone with one of our members who called me up last night. And, and he said, Tom, I need to move to Bob. I said, you know what? I can talk to you on Monday. Uh, we've got a conference schedule. He said, no, no, no. I need to talk to you. So I've got three clients that I'm going to lose in the next week unless I can talk to Bob. And I'm like, OK, let's 
get on the phone and talk. And, and we did. And it's, it's just one of the things we're seeing every single day. And it's, it's, it's every day. So I'll repeat that again, because Tom doesn't have the microphone, and I think we're webcasting. So he was on the phone at 6.30 this morning, talking with the clients who are going to lose their customers that they didn't have a cloud solution. And they're talking about a server-based solution, not just hosted uh, web, uh, hosted email, or some BDR solution. So cloud servers are here to stay. Public and private data centers offer cloud services and storage on demand. This is a common theme in the public today for technology people who are reading documents. They go to their CIO document or Fortune magazine, and they're reading these owners of these companies reading these things, and they see all these different service providers promoting purchase what you need, scale up and down for what your cores, enterprise IT. And Tom, about the, Tom gave us an example of that. So they're hearing it out there right now. The problem is, is at the SMB level is that you guys don't really have what I would consider, up until now, a solution that you feel comfortable delivering. All right? And we have to cut through all the noise to help get that conversation like that. So there is more than, uh, so cloud is more than just hosted exchange and BDR. OK? We know that. We've had this conversation for three, four years now. Um, hosted exchange has been a race to the bottom. What is it now? Eight bucks a mailbox, right? Something like that? What are you making on that? 35%? No, 15%, right? On eight bucks. That's not a model that's gonna make you guys any kind of money, all right? Link, SharePoint, these are all hosted services out there. Um, there's BDR solutions by the dozen available out there today that you can hook up to as well. Those can make you a little bit of money. Um, there may be a possibility of some other service that is available, maybe you some, uh, uh, a drive that you can get, maybe a, a jungle disk or something like that. Five bucks a month. It's not a workable model. Um, on top of that, if you ask the customers, are they in the cloud, they're going to say, they're going to turn back around and look at that server room and they're going, no, nah, it doesn't appear to. I still got a server. I still got my applications. I still got storage. I still have this stuff sitting in the closet. So why hasn't people moved so far? Why haven't we gone from on-premise to the cloud yet? You would think this would have been a no-brainer by now. Problem is, is the line of business applications. You have vertically oriented market applications that only run on Windows 2008 R2 servers, and, and God forbid they only run on 2003. Okay? I'll tell you that I'm here to tell you that both those can go to the cloud. Both of them. So, therefore, you have to have a leverage to cloud. You have to have a solution that will allow for the migration of line of business applications, whether they be on premise or in the cloud, okay? So let's talk about some of this stuff. We've got this stuff covered across the side, the word processing, the spreadsheets, the databases, you know, Cloud Nations and the SPLA provider of Citrix and uh, Microsoft products. You know, we can get you all day stuff, whether it be Office uh, uh, Pro or Standard or, uh, any of their Microsoft product stack that's available that you can have, uh, databases, SQL Server, um, a lot of number of vertical applications. We also have, we're a commercial provider of Intuit software. But we're not specialists in healthcare manufacturing, education, and insurance, legal. We're not hit any of those parts. This is the areas that people have their, their, their backgrounds and necessary, but you have to have those mixed together to make this work. So here's our message. Don't buy another server. As a matter of fact, that message is not even coming from us to, to you. That message is being communicated to your customers. Why are you buying servers? The rapid fall of servers right now in the sale out in the marketplace from Dell, IBM, HP, Acer, et cetera, out there is indicating that that's going on as we speak. So what are your choices to roll out a cloud server model that you can feel comfortable picking your customers from on-premise to the cloud. Because you're talking about virtualization of not only the server, you're talking about virtualization of the applications, the storage, the other components. So you have basically three options. The first one is public cloud services. We have a nice partner here called Savas. They're more than happy to give you that infrastructure and give you cloud services by the, hour, by the month, uh, various other services that are great. Love those guys. Um, you also have a bunch of other ones that are out there as well. Google, Amazon, Rackspace, HP. They go on and on. Microsoft. 
Uh, these are self-provisioned and managed. That means that you guys have to put together the environments, build them up, and structure them, virtualize the applications, and connect your customers one at a time. All right? This is your job here, potentially. You could do it that way. Second one is, is you can co-locate and have managed servers. You can rent hardware from someone like uh, uh, SoftLayer or some other colo that might be nearby you where you can rent their actual machines and then provision it yourself. Or, which we've had a number of folks talk about, I can build it myself. Now, I absolutely, what I mean by build it myself, you can buy the hardware, you can rack and stack it. I'm absolutely convinced that everyone in this room has the chops to do that. You guys are smart people. You have good people that, are, that know how to handle terminal services, multiple active directory structures, know how to set up file servers and redundant systems and RAID systems and NASs and be able to put all that stuff together. I'm quite certain you can do that. I'm here to tell you that we didn't go to NASA and ask them to help us launch this thing. You know, but what we did do is put together a system that actually does that but does it in a multi-tenant environment. And I'll tell you why multi-tenancy is so important here. Because your customers are making what kind of decision? A financial decision, okay? Financial decision. And if you don't have a financial conversation with them around this, it's a dead deal. So, there are some technology obstacles when you do it on your own. So let me make sure we understand. So if you were to just take a spun up server, let's say take it over at uh, uh, Rackspace, for example, you can say, hey, okay, I got an application server, that's fine, so I'm gonna put my um, PC law on it or some EMR software or something like that, I'm gonna put that on there, that's great. It's got Microsoft Office loaded, it's got potentially QuickBooks loaded on it as well. That all works, that's great. Um, I can put a domain controller and Active Directory in that. I can actually probably put the services on the same one, okay? Uh, I can put my RDP clients. I may have to put a VPN between that and them, and that means everywhere that my client wants to connect, they got a VPN to it. So if I have an iPad, okay, I can go out and get the, the RDP client for um, the iPad, and then I can put the VPN in place, and I got to put the services for the HTTP in place, and oof, how much is that going to cost me? for what, 10 people, 12 people? It can get kind of bumpy. Then, then you got backup, virus protection, security, firewalling, routing, uh, you know, IPs. So you can see that there's obviously some challenges there. So what I'm here to tell you about is that what we provide here is a way for you to spin up a single application server. We call it a V server, okay? Where that you have one server and it acts and behaves exactly like the server on premise. So it is a Windows R2 2008 64-bit machine, or it's a 2003 machine, okay? It runs in a collection here based on your customers in a multi-tenancy environment where we, as an organization, have provided you with the file services, the uh, web services for connecting for HTTP, SQL servers if you need it, domain controllers, any of the terminal services, Citrix licensing services, load balancing, routers and configures and firewalls that you can connect your users to their applications here from anywhere, any place, anytime, any device. So if you're familiar with the Citrix receiver, that's all you need. No VPNs, no special firewalling, no routing, iPads, Macs, PCs, Android tablets, my cell phone, you can get your desktop. As a matter of fact, this presentation is being delivered from uh, our facility on the East Coast out of Ashburn, Washington, DC. This is my hosted desktop with our V server in that data center on the East Coast, and that's where it's coming from. Okay? I've been living this solution myself, personally drinking our own champagne for a little over four years now, and I would never, ever, ever go back. It's, it's that good and that beneficial for a guy like myself who just needs my stuff on all the time. I never have to worry about backing it up. I never worry about updating my virus protection. I never have to worry about am I connected securely. It's all there. So just dump it if you guys got questions here. I mean, don't stop me. I'm go yes, sir. Just a quick question concerning the security. So uh, the, the Citrix receiver uh, connectivity is uh, secure in of itself? 
Absolutely. So the Citrix receiver is a 256-bit encrypted HTTPS connection into a system called a NetScaler. Okay? If you're familiar with the Citrix architecture, 100% of the Fortune 500 companies use Citrix, ZenApp, Zen Desktop, and Citrix receiver connectivity for their infrastructure. 100% of those companies. It is bulletproof industrial strength IT that's been out for a little over 10 years in ubiquitous world. It has never made itself down to the, the small business level though. Okay, this is really the first introduction of this type of technology, this secure technology making its way down into the small businesses. You know? uh, this is something I found new because I've been a Citrix guy for a while and I just kind of assumed that the small business people knew this stuff and I, it was really a, a, a news to me that, wow, Citrix never really made it downstream. Okay, so great question. Thank you. Any others? Okay, so remember, yell out, say, hey, I don't believe that. That doesn't make sense. You know, uh, and let me challenge me here. I'm more than happy to. I love talking technical. Okay, uh, so I hope everybody understands the value here, why this matters because of the structure, because we're going to go back to what? Risk and cost, right? If we're back at risk and cost, then we dramatically bring down the risk, right? So now this customer is going, dang, this is a pretty, pretty industrial strength solution if you're selling it correctly. Cost, wow, I just eliminated all of these things. I don't have to manage them at all. And moreover, and I'll show you here in our demonstration, um, that we have a management console that will allow you to manage all your customers from one pane of glass. Yes, let me get to see you. Okay, so the multi-tenant capability we're, we're talking about here, how do you get around the objection that, okay, now my stuff is mixed with everybody else's, uh, I'm a law firm, yep. C CNA uh, insurance has told me that if I do that, I'm practicing malpractice. That's a great question. Um, so, when you create a multi-tenancy architecture, the key is uh, separation of church and state is what I call it, right? You gotta make sure that people have their data in the right locations and areas. Um, the only government agency or government organization that I know that says dedicate hardware to specifically your systems is FIPS. Okay, FIPS compliance in the government level says you gotta have hardware. You can host it there, but you gotta have dedicated hardware. All the rest of them around, okay, what's the degree that I'm willing to live with? Okay, so the way we do that is for those customers who require very specific um, isolation of their services in our service, we say one customer, one server. Flat out, it's all subnetted out. There's a dedicated volume that's attached to that server inside the data center, okay? Um, the routing and permissions are all set up accordingly. We actually have ethical hackers come in there and show them and prove them. If you need to even go that level, we have an outside firm that will come in and ethically hack. Uh, it's good stuff, actually. That's a great question. Um, finally, also, the, again, back to the Citrix part. This is their world. You know, we've, uh, we use what's called a reference architecture with their top engineers, and we laid this out in a way that we believe is uh, pretty darn bulletproof. Okay. So, talk about this, uh, the line of business servers, the applications of the best data centers. So, we are not in the data center business. This is the most important thing I want to communicate to you. Cloud Nation does not own data centers. We have one small co-location facility in Irvine where the multi-tenancy domain management and, and single pane of glass is all managed from, but we reach out to data center partners like our folks back there from Savas, okay, where our stack is placed into that data center. So what does that mean? Why is that important? Well, what you don't want is potentially somebody who's underfunded to be propping up data centers and cutting costs on your hardware that your customer is running on. You want a name brand who has a long history of data center management, who has five nines redundancy, geo redundant, but also rents their services out by a monthly and hourly basis based on small compute power and storage. So everybody knows the Amazon EC2, everybody knows Rackspace, everyone's a thing. So what you want to do is get all of those guys fighting against each other, okay, for, for a price, highest availability, lowest cost. 
So we extend that V server, that architecture that I just showed you, that one right here, this whole thing lives in a Cloud Nation certified data center. We have a facility out in the Amazon, the EC2 facility. We're working right now propping up our, our data centers in the Savas facilities. They have four of them spread across the country. Um, and the reason that's important is for that you can have your customers' data local to them. If they really ask, hey, where's my data? You go ahead and just drive on over to the facility and say, yep, it's right in that building. Okay, super important. More importantly, if you're dealing with HIPAA and the new BAA stuff that's out right now, you're going to want a data center that's going to be able to sign a BAA. Right? And the people who have that ability are going to be those key players in the marketplace that will agree to do that. And if you have specifically a data center that you're dealing with that you want to deal with personally, for example, let's say you've got somebody who you really trust in the Dallas area and you're from Dallas. You love what they do. You can engage with Cloud Nation directly, um, and we can put our stack in their data center to deal with maybe a very specific customer need. And now we're servicing out of there. Okay. So our open platform lets you have virus protection and backup, one admin console for all your customers, unlimited file storage and sharing. Now this is really cool. Because you're plugging in, your mounted drive is going to be attached to a data center with maybe a pentabyte, two pentabytes. I would say Savas probably manages well over that. Okay? So you have unlimited file share scalability. So if you have a customer with a lot of data that needs to archive it, this is a great thing to do. No Active Directory DCs to manage, no VPNs required. Talked about that. Okay. So let's talk about cost. Why is this important? But we're back to risk and cost. If you have a customer who wants that one-on-one -on -one relationship, a lot of pros on there gives them a nice, comfortable feeling that they have their own dedicated server that they're working with. Um, they have the resources and their dedicated performance. The cons that they can be more expensive. For example, let me give you some, we're pretty transparent with our pricing. The wholesale to the customer price for you guys is $185 per month for a server. We call a medium-sized server. Handles anywhere between eight to 10 people. You can connect those folks, put your line of business applications on them. That's $185. Your cost, you mark it up to whatever you would like it to be and resell it. You want to make it 300 bucks a month because you can. You're making 115 bucks every month for that V server. However, that might not go over very well with a company with five or seven people and they're really cost conscious, right? So what I suggest is that you spin up a V server that is a one to many. And what does that mean? That you have to have a console that allows you to put multiple customers on the same server. Keeps them separated, keeps everybody separated by the active, it's a multi-tenancy active directory structure. It keeps them separated, but they act and behave as if they're their own company. They will never ever know the difference. There is no borders they're going over. No one's spanning different data segments and stuff like that. So you can take a company with an accounting company of three or four people, put them on the same server as a sales organization with five people, put them on the same organization that's a professional services, like a consultant who travels around all over the place. It's just one guy, but he wants the full desktop experience. And then parse out that server cost to each of them. $45 for that person, $50 for that person, $70 for that person, and next thing you know, you've made double or even triple the money you would make by having a single server but multiple companies on it. And the only way you're going to do that is if you have a management console that allows for you to keep them separated and a domain that manages it for you. Okay? So I'm going to show you how to do that. Now, what are the pros? Very cost effective, and there's a lot more money for you to be made here in that area. Number two, one server to manage. Okay? Three, higher margins, obviously. The pro, the cons, have you ever heard of noisy neighbors? This is a data center term for people who run out of space. Noisy neighbors means that you have one host, one, one host machine. Okay, you've got five or six different um, servers on it, and one of those servers is actually just going just cranking on the CPU, just hammering it, and it affects the other people on that. 
Now, a lot of these big data centers have already got that figured out. They balance these things out, and it's all naturally managed. However, when all your customers are on one CPU, I mean one uh, V server, you have to be mindful that your other customers on there are not trying to do a very large data dump and are sucking down all the CPU. So you have to make sure you're mixing your customers right and that, that you know what applications they're running. That's the, truly the only drawback. Security-wise, no difference. No difference. It's the same architecture structure inside. Do you have a question? No? Okay, any questions around that? This is a, a key component about how to manage these servers. Okay. So, again, uh, we just talked about that. And, oops. Am I going backwards? Sorry about that. Okay. So if you look at our, our data center uh, partners and our in initial stack, we're a Microsoft Citrix organization. All of our services are delivered via ZenApp with a Citrix receiver connector. It is basically a terminal services uh, RDP client structure. So all your applications are gonna need to be virtualized and run on a server. In addition to that, these will run in highly available, cost-effective data centers uh, of your choice. So if you happen to be in the Austin area where the rack space facility is, you can have it there. If you happen to be in Ashburn, Washington, uh, Virginia, excuse me, Washington, D.C., you can have it in the Amazon facility. If you're in the Irvine area, you can have it in the Savas facility. The reason it's important to be close by is so that you have low latency for the connectivity to that customer service. You want to have sub-25, sub-30 millisecond connectivity for a really super experience. However, what I'm showing you right now, I'm running at 80 milliseconds between here and that facility, but because of the backbone and the net scalers in place, it's deduped the communication back and forth in such a way, it feels like it's sub-10 millisecond latency. Okay. All right, demonstration. So, questions before I show you anything at all? Nothing? Yes, sir. You've talked about the uh, server uh, being virtualized or server being up there. Uh, what do you have in the way of uh, VDI? So, um, virtual desktop infrastructure, VDI, is a term that has very, very broad meaning. Um, there are two types of VDI that's out there. One is a actual Windows 7 or some form of Windows desktop operating system running in a virtual environment. Other people speak of VDI as what I'm doing right now, which is actually a terminal services mode, what they call a hosted desktop. So I'm assuming you're talking about an actual Windows session itself running, like a Windows 7 or something like that. Okay, no? The hosting, well that's, that's what we run right now. Okay, so we run the actual delivery of the Windows desktop under uh, Zen app. So I'm going to pop out of here. And what you're going to see here, whoops, is down on the bottom, you'll see that I have, whoops, I can't see it. There it is right there. Um, I have my PowerPoint here, and that's actually a delivered application. But let me go ahead and do this, pop out of there. And I'll go ahead and close that right now. Now, I just terminated my virtual session back to my server that I had that's in Ashburn at the Amazon facility right now. So I have an icon right here, you'll notice, that says V Desktop. Where is it? There it is down there. Okay. I'll double click that guy. And what's going to happen now is it's going to connect it to my desktop that's running in the facility on the East Coast. Okay, so there's a terminal services running up. You can see it's a Windows 2008 R2 data center version. All right, that is connected to that V server that's in that location as an RDP connection, but it's done through Zen app and it will serve up a complete Windows desktop. Okay, and it's important that you see how it's doing that and the process. Typically, I leave my session running. Once I fire it up, I can close my laptop, open it, that kind of thing. I can switch it over to an iPad, cut over to it. I leave it on all the time. 
and just reconnect to it whenever I need to. But I did this for purposes of showing you how it worked so that you know that, uh, um, that the process is, like, is actually firing up. So specifically, when you fire up, it takes about a minute to a minute and a half to start up the applications and to assign the privileges and to go through the Active Directory so that it knows what applications are needed to get associated to my desktop, okay? So while that's doing that, let me go ahead and uh, also show you my portal here. So um, I'm going to go ahead and take care of that. Uh, okay. Hey, Harry. Do we have a microphone I can put on here so I can put this down? All right. So I can see why I can see why you had this here. Oops. Any questions, by the way, while uh, we re mic? Any questions? Jay, anything online? Everybody's pretty quiet right now. Oh, boy. Post lunch. <laughs> Post lunch. Okay, please yeah, continue. Yeah, I, I can see some lazy eyes out there, too. So um, I, I get it. I, this can be pretty dry stuff if it's not something that you uh, are interested in or even understand that, the, that you're concerned about. So I'm trying to keep it lively. Uh, all right. So. This is the control panel. This is a, actually a Citrix product uh, that's called CPSM, um, and it is a control panel that we host and manage. There is a, a, a multi-tenancy active directory underneath it that spreads out to all these data centers worldwide. Okay, So you get a login, and so does your customer. But you as a reseller and as a member of Cloud Nation, get your own separate reseller section of this place where you manage your clients that are attached to a vServer. Okay. So, I'm coming in, whoops, admin CS test. Oh, of course. Oh, not CS. Sorry about that. That's it. Should be Cloud Nation, not CS. There we go. Okay. So, now that I'm in here, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to click on customers, and it's going to show me that I have a Cloud Nation test reseller account here. So right now, I have one customer created in here. I can add unlimited number of customers under this structure and manage them and assign them to V servers. Okay? And now that I'm under that customer, I have the way to manage the services. I can edit the customer profile. I can look at their users. I can disable or deprovision the server and this customer. If this customer doesn't pay, I can turn them off right here and instantly they're unable to access to that server and their services. Okay, that's a pretty hard, heavy handed, but it may have to happen, right? Uh, so let's go, to, let's go to the list of users. So we have a couple users in here. I can easily add a new user anytime I want and now instead of having to know the active directory structure and where all the applications are assigned and what resources need to put, be put to it, uh, any of the OUs, et cetera, I didn't, I'm isolated from all of that. So specifically, I can come in here and say for Joe Smith, you can see he's got a little clock on him right there. Um, if I go and say, let's edit that user, you'll, we can see why. Well, here's Joe Smith. I can reset his password. And when you reset the password, it resets the password across our whole platform. So for example, we actually offer hosted exchange. But because we're open architecture, you can have anybody's hosted exchange. Doesn't matter. But if you choose ours, it's built in directly through the Active Directory. If you need an AD sync, we can absolutely do that as well. Not a problem. Count settings here. Ah, looks like uh, someone disabled him. Shut him off as of April 31st. I'm going to go ahead and extend him out to the 10th. All right, and we do this for demo counts. So this is actually a sandbox that we have that we train our resellers on and how to send out samples of a hosted desktop, if you would, attached to a vServer in storage. So. Um, I go ahead and bring that down. I click on provision. And now you can see this little guy spinning around up there. While it's spinning around, it's, uh, oh, it's already done. That was uh, implemented now. It's across the network. And on the May 10th, that count will expire. OK. Moreover, let's go back to Joe here and under services. I see I've got three files, uh, uh, Citrix file servers in exchange. We actually have quite a large list of other services that are available. These just happen to be a few on this one. SQL Server, CRM, 
uh, file servers, but the bulk of what most customers are asking for are these basic three. And when I put Citrix on here, what that really means is I got a list of all of the services whoops, that are now applications that we can run for this particular customer. So this just happens to be a subset on this particular V server. This is very important that you understand this, that those applications you see listed there are specific to that server. If you provision another server with different applications, it's a different list, okay? Real simple, you, you provision your terminal services server with the applications you want, they get published to here, and then when I go in and start clicking on and off these services here, the next time that person logs in, they now have that application. It is that simple. You don't have to manage the Active Directory. Moreover, you see this little guy right here? That means if I turn that on, I am now the local administrator for that server. So instead of RDPing into that server with an exposed IP address and a VPN to have to manage it, you just go in through the Citrix here like I just did, okay? And now you're the local admin. Anywhere an HTTP connection is established. No VPN, no separate RDP connection, you are now the local admin on that server. It's a big, big, big deal, okay? So, you know, if we had a look at this, this is my actual delivered desktop. You're now looking at my personal one. This is what I live in a day in and day out. Um, I happen to use all the basic applications here and I um, personally like Trillion myself for this stuff. I got rid of my webinar, go to meeting, go to uh, um, webinar stuff off of my desktop, but I haven't deleted the icons yet. Uh, I like having multiple browsers on here. I also like having three different versions of browsers. Okay. Right. Yes, sir. Robert, we have a question here yep, go for it. Uh, from David. And David says, why should we recommend our client use a new and unproven company like Cloud Nation instead of a more established famous name company? Let me guess that's from a competitor? I, no, just somebody named David, that's all I know. I'm teasing, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, great question. If, I was in the, if our company was in the data center business, Absolutely, I'd be asking that question. Because really at the end of the day, it's about stability and availability of that data that you're moving for your customer into that platform, All right? We are simply leveraging a technology foundation that is well proven and in place today with key partners like Microsoft and Citrix, key data center partners like Savas, uh, Amazon, Rackspace, these customers and partners are well established and have deep, deep profitable companies. We are not the manager of those data centers, of those technologies, of the services. We are the orchestrator of them. Very important that if we were to go under, Cloud Nation were to fold up and go away, nothing changes from you. We hand over the IP address and this infrastructure for you and you can decide how you want to lift that data off of those servers and move them in back to where you want to go. This is not a lock-in by any means. Big difference. It's not lock-in. Hopefully I've answered that question well. Yes, sir. Uh, we got to get the... Hey. Come on, Harry. How much time we got? All right, we got a few more minutes left. Yes, sir. How hard is it to get a new software installed? And mainly, how hard is it to maintain it updated? Oh, turn that back on. Okay. okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> how hard is to get a new software installed? Yep. And how hard is to maintain it updated, especially if it's in another language? Perfect. How hard is it today to maintain a on-premise Windows 2008 R2 server? How hard is it to maintain and update the profiles in another language? You're doing that now, right? Okay, nothing changes. You still make the management dollars that you're doing now. If you have an RMM that you need to connect to like a Kaseya, a GFI, or a LabTech, install the agent on the server, monitor it, Make your money. Nothing changes. From your point of view, the only thing that will absolutely change is your lowering of your um, 
support that you have to remember and maintain the active directory structures, the firewalling, the backup, the virus protection updates, all those things, they're already in place. You're now managing the server like you always have been. Okay? Uh, you mentioned before a certain number of users, mm -hmm. eight to ten. What what's the limitations on what we've got here? Is is right. it, you know, a single tenant can support how many? Well, it's all about this it, classic computer, right? It depends. Um, if you look at what it takes to support users in an RDP terminal services on prem premise, you're dealing with pretty much the same same equation. Okay. If you have an, an office that has 20 users that are working just fine with a eight gigabytes of RAM, you know, four cores, okay, has 500 gig attached storage, model that. If that works just fine, that works just fine in this environment. Remember, because your RDP connections are being offloaded to another set of servers that you're not paying for. So all that the traffic coming through, the encryption, the decryption processes, the security, the licensing, that's all being handled by another set of servers. So really all it is is processing of those applications. So what I recommend is when you provision that we have a look at the applications and see what's on premise now, and then do a, a corresponding scaling to make sure that they match. And that's what Cloud Nation is here for as an advisor to help you do that. Okay, he had a question. For uh, on pay customer, how long are you gonna keep the data on your server? Our, our terms of service that we have thing is 90 days, okay, for non-paying. So if, even if the account dies, we keep it for 90 days. If it's over 90 days, they want the data back? We're gonna pick up the phone and call you, okay? <laughs> Be perfectly honest with you, we're not in the, the, uh, the price per storage and gig in these areas is pretty low. Um, you know, it, the, if you look at the storage cost that your customer is going to have, that's not the, the dollar number. The dollar number is going to be the actual server compute and the connection piece. Okay, storage tends to be a smaller part of that. Oh, by the way, um, you don't need a BDR solution with this. Well, okay. Think about the cost things that are going to go away. Virus protection, backup, security. Uh, infrastructure on a, on a redundancy. If you have somebody who absolutely demands that that stuff stay back on presence, all right, you might want to put a device that's actually repeating the other direction, right? Taking it down from the cloud and bringing it back down. Okay, you can do it that way. Or if you want to go from data center to data center. Yes, sir. Okay, we've got about 15 minutes. Uh, looks like a couple of questions, just FYI. Yep. All right, so you're saying no uh, AV. You're saying no BDR. So we're being 100% certain that the data center's technology is infallible? Yeah, no. I don't, I don't agree with that. And from a virus standpoint, um, this machine's got an IP address, and I'm depending upon, when we set up our systems, as we have in the past, we always have multi-gateway uh, methodology from a malware and spyware standpoint. Right. So we have it at the firewall level, we have it at the desktop level. Right. You're saying that there is zero risk, acceptable risk from whose point of view and not having some type of AV at the client level where the customer is exposed to who knows what from the public internet. Okay. Uh, are you, do you use credit cards on the internet? Sure. Okay. But my system. Trust, hey, let, but, me, let me finish. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Are you comfortable with putting your credit card and having it reserved and kept on making purchases? You obviously are. I know I am. I don't. I do not allow anybody to retain my credit card information ever. But it's processed through, though, right? It's processed. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, I, I, what I'm what I'm trying to get at here is that there is all sorts of acceptable risks that all of us take every day. You know what? Airplanes crash. Doesn't stop us from getting on them. Okay. That happens, all right? And, and, and let me follow up with the rest of the, the, the conversation, but I want to make sure I explain it to you in a, in a way that, 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 you under, that I think is important, and that is you don't have an IP address to the server, okay? It's a private cloud. It is only one way in and one way out, and that's an HTTPS. Browsing the internet? Browsing the internet from within it, though, going yes. out. Yeah, so I open up a browser on that session and I point it to wherever. Yep. And that space is, that web page has been compromised and has malware. Sure. And I bring that in and 
every it's well designed and it gets past any kind of signature at the firewall level and now lands on my desktop. It doesn't I, land on your desktop. Where does it go? It doesn't come in. There's no way to install software in our system once you've locked it down. This is important to understand is that the user level has a locked down system. They are unable to change their applications. They are unable to load new software. They are unable to install JavaScript. They are unable to do anything to that system. They are working in a restricted environment. And anytime something comes in that is un determined, et cetera, any different than any virus protection system that's going to detect right now. If it gets past that, we're all in trouble, right? Okay. You're not going to have any more virus protection than I'm going to have with the available services out there. So once it gets in, it gets locked down and pushed out. These are um, what I call um, persistent and non-persistent desktops. A persistent desktop allows for only the user environment to be replicated from place to place, while a non-persistent means it wipes it out every time they log in and it starts anew. So the only way in, the only doorway in and out to our system, HTTPS through our net scalers and our firewalls and our DMZs. Um, this is millions and millions and millions of users and customers of Citrix on this platform, day in and day out, that have not been compromised. Okay? There is no public IP for that server. The only way you can get in is through the V desktop and the Citrix app. Okay? So is the internet traffic that I open up a browser? On that page. Okay, I'm running a risk now, right? Yeah. All right, all right. I get you. But hey, I love a good challenge. I really do. Okay, so here's my V desktop right now. Right. Okay. I probably should run Internet Explorer, right? Uh, do I even have it? It's on the desktop. Left. Left, left. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Hang on. I just want to make sure that I'm doing the right thing here. All right. So. Uh, Let's see if we can't find us a virus, right? Okay. <laughs> My point is this. This is standard browsing, right? Okay. I've got scanned email coming in from my exchange. We use McAfee's MX Logic uh, services. It traps and, and scans every link that's coming in from email. It scans everything going out. Okay. It's blocking and, and, and managing all the restrictive sites that we have. Um, you have to add trusted sites to things in here before it'll actually do it. You can control trusted sites, for example, inside this environment as the local admin. Okay? So if that system is local admin. No, nope, this one is not. Okay, but if it is. Yep. And the desktop user environment is persistent. Okay. Then compromisation is possible. Oh, that's exactly right. That's why you're the only one with local admin. That's a whole other discussion for some customers, but. Right, I mean, but, but hopefully I'm asking your question here. I mean, this yeah. is good I stuff. Mean, I mean, I, I see where you're going and I understand that. I'm just comparing this to, you know, existing environments and if you sit down with a CFO and you say, I have a, uh, a cost versus reward discussion I'd like to have with you on eliminating all of your servers for a cloud solution. Right. And you have a culture there that has not adopted lockdown desktops. Um, that yep. the answer that we have to that nowadays is multiple layers of, of an AV solution and something that will protect the user. Yep. And I don't care how good it is. Yep. Um, stuff makes it through because the people developing this malware and this stuff in many cases are as smart, if not smarter, than the guys who are writing this stuff to prevent it. Correct. So where that risk uh, may be very low, mm -hmm. the bottom line is it, it can occur. Mm -hmm. And by not having anything at all on the desktop just seems like you're having seems like a lot of exposure. Not anything at all. What's that? What do you mean, not anything at all? Well, within that environment itself, if you're going to maintain a persistent desktop, the customer's it's not getting reset when they log off. You right. know, that profile is there. Yep. And the profile in a Windows environment is what's vulnerable to contamination because there's all kinds of hidden files. And when something does make it to the machine, that's where it lives. So if you've got users who need to add apps because that's what it's going to take to get the sale, I'm just looking at your solution or your, your uh, comment of saying, no, we don't need any AV. You don't need AV in most cases is kind of what it sounds like. Okay, so you misunderstand me. This already has AV built in. Okay, that's what I was not seeing because okay. I don't see something there. <laughs> so I didn't know we were, we were, we were missing, the, missing the communication. Absolutely, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, do. <laughs> Probably about five more minutes of lecture and a All couple right. more minutes for questions. Yeah, yeah, There's, there's, that's, that's awesome. Um, boy, great question. I'm glad we had a chance to, to 
to go back and forth on that. Um, down here, uh, we are part of the Microsoft stack. We use uh, uh, System Center 12 DPM. Okay, works great. You know, uh, every time something comes, then we haven't had a virus show up in our infrastructure in well over about a year and a couple months. Occasionally, one will show up on somebody's server that we don't know about, but it tends to be more of a, uh, a little Java piece that snuck itself in, you know, and it gets trapped and uh, it gets caught. But because of our subnetting and the structure that we have, it's, it's isolated to that customer, okay? That customer. So more specifically, um, the, here's the benefit, by the way, of having this connected to a bandwidth that's over you know, maybe like an OC5 or something like that, outbound. I mean, I browse the internet at speeds and downloads at speeds that just baffle my mind now, you know, instead of at the on-premise browsing. This is the inherent benefit of having a server there that you're going through. Okay, any more questions around that? Just a quick shout out to uh, David who gave us that tough question earlier. Yeah. Um, so. He's David's from Pacific Technology and Business Services in San Diego. Right on, David. And we're going to go talk to him. Yes, we are. <laughs> Qu question over here. Yes, sir. So I'm, I'm the user, and you know, we all know what users are. Um, minimize what you've got on your screen right now. Great question. What happens when they go to the browser at the machine level? OK, well, that's where I am right here, right? Right. OK. Um, this, actually go ahead and log out. Oops, there we go. Uh, this is still their computer. This is my laptop right here, right? No, I know that's your laptop. We were to, now it's double management. I thought you guys liked that. <laughs> no, yeah. I, 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 I understand but you, what you're But saying. you're following me. You, you know, users, when they boot up their computer, they don't want to see a Windows start and a Windows start. Exactly. So let me show you what you would do. There's two things, if you're familiar, like again, this is a Citrix issue. You have Citrix receiver, and you can run it in a, what's called the Citrix receiver mode, which takes the whole screen up, and they'll never know it's ever there, anything underneath it. So as soon as they log in, it goes straight into um, uh, what they call a, a kiosk mode, okay? Or you can do it like I'm doing, which is in a browser, and I have my whole window in a browser. I like doing that because I like doing Skype on my desktop. That's the only reason I have it there, okay? For me personally, is, uh, Video chat doesn't work well across the wire on, a, on, a, on that, okay? So I keep it outside. Short of that, I don't care what happens to that desktop, personally. You know, I'll wipe it out and start over. Um, so this is a great way to reprovision that stuff. So you have two, two ways. So if down here, down the corner, you'll notice I have a Citrix receiver right there running. If I bring that up, I'm able to do a couple of things. That's really kind of cool. Here's all my applications right there. I can go and say, oh, what other applications do I have? Well, I have all these. And let's say I want to add OneNote to my desktop. So there's OneNote. I'm going to go ahead and grab it uh, right there, drag it up. And now if I start OneNote, I'm bringing in OneNote on my desktop right there from my data center as an icon, as an app. OK? Super. It's easy. If you guys only want to do application delivering in the same structure, you only want to do their line of business apps, and you want to keep everything on a desktop, come see us. It's exactly the same model. Exactly. Other questions? We're about done. Oh, yes, oh OK. Stand by. If you have the multi-tenancy shared server f for multiple clients, yep. will they all be seeing the full list of offerings? No. So that's a great question. You weren't here for a little earlier when we had, the, had that. So um, if you come back to here, and we have, whoops, let me put my glasses back on. There they are. How much time do we have, Harry? Uh, about uh, three, four minutes. OK. We'll go till 4.10. OK, so again, we'll come back to here. We'll bring up the users. Here's, uh, here's my actual admin user, by the way. So oh, sorry about that. Services. I have Exchange, so I'm going to bring this Exchange down here. You'll notice that I have the 
admin level sit down here like you're talking about, that admin user now has those abilities you're talking about. Okay? And that's as easy as it is, just like that. Okay? Um, so if you want to turn on which users have what software here uh, missed, then you would come in here and say, I don't want them to have out whoops, I don't want them to have Outlook, PowerPoint, or Project, and I'm gonna turn those off. Uh, I don't want them to have Paint, uh, PaintNet or the PDF Creator or the Piscata or the QuickBook Pro. Turn those off. What are you getting at? You got a company that's using, you know, s some large ERP system. They have an app there, the, uh, uh, but they're not actually of bigs. They only have 20, 30 gigabytes, so you can share it with some other tenant on this server. But the other client is using QuickBooks Pro, so. Right. I would not share tenants with 30 people. I would share tenants with five people. Okay? A 30 tenant person understands the cost of IT. A five person company often doesn't. Cloud Nation specifically targets 50 and fewer. If you have clients with 50 and fewer desktops, this is what we do in a cost effective manner. If you have tenants with 100, 200, 500, we absolutely can support these folks and deploy them, but you often have IT people on staff who probably have an alternative idea to what they want to do, and it's not this. Okay, so you're going to be swimming up a creek because this often replaces them and reduces their IT staff by half. I've done this five separate times for companies with three to four hundred people, and the CFO laid off half his IT staff when they rolled this out, and the other half that were there were looking for something to do. It's not going to be generally available at that level for a little while because there's a still room of resistance. However, at the 50 and fewer where there is no IT person and you are that person, this is ideal solution for them. Okay? Hopefully that answers your question. Last question. Oh, there you are. Yeah, um, a lot of times, uh, let's see. What's the story with USB connectivity? Great question. Matter of fact, I want to expand that out into two parts um, real quickly, having to do with this endpoint device. I have a laptop here. This is a device that I do not want to have any of the data that's either on it come into the system or any of the system data come out and come onto this. I want to lock it down, and all I want to do is access it from here. What you notice down at the bottom, you'll see it says local drives and printers, and we can actually get more granular to local drives as opposed to um, Okay, let's go here. So, you have the ability under my doc, you'll notice here, I'll bring this up. I have a share drive. This is all the stuff that I have that's on my share drive. But you'll see there's something that says local disk here. Okay, and notice it starts populating because it's going from the east coast to my desktop back again and then displaying what's there. Okay, so I'll come into users. Here's Robert Christensen. And you can start seeing that I have my documents here. I'm able to upload and download files from this device here into that system and back again. Moreover, though, if I don't want to do that, this is the important part, I can shut off local printers and local devices, including USB ports. Citrix works across the board with USB devices, with exception of some. Those are the custom ones, like the dental office one that they stick the, the, uh, the camera in the mouth, right? Challenging. So if you join Cloud Nation, you go through our CNCP training, we educate you on the clients that are going to be good for this and some of the clients that are not. And those ones that have that USB piece right there, like that, we just have the device be local. And then we work out a replication of getting the data up and back and forth to the server. Still secure, still uh, through a tunnel. Yes, sir. Uh, quick two-parter. Um, do you manage the SPLA licensing on these, or is that something that the, uh, uh, the VAR would handle? We handle all SPLA um, reporting of software. So when you subscribe to a V desktop or a server or stuff like that, you have no reporting responsibility in Microsoft at all. The SPLA licensing is directly handled by us. Except with Citrix as well as with Intuit. 
We're an Intuit commercial hoster, so you have also the ability to bring up any of the QuickBook products. Okay, so uh, QuickBooks Pro is officially supported on your... Uh, right. on, okay. Yep. Uh, the other, second part of the question was burning DVDs out of the cloud. You have to bring, the you have to bring them down and then burn them. Okay. Local device. Okay. All right. Hey, I want to shout out. I want to tell uh, that's Maureen uh, Sullivan right there in the back in the pink. Um, she is our, our Citrix, um, I wouldn't say rep, you're my partner. Okay. Anyway, so we're one of 24 worldwide partners from, uh, for Citrix with regards to this technology. And uh, we're very happy to be one of those partners, meaning that this platform we're rolling out has been given a nice gold star next to them, and we're very happy to be that partner of Citrix for the last couple years. So anyway, uh, thank you very much, and I appreciate your time. All right, thank you very much, Robert. A uh, little bit of help.